Hi, I'm Lynn Short from the Humber Arboretum. I'm standing in front of a huge patch of Phragmites australis, the non-native invasive species that has basically come to North America over the last 100 years, but in the last 25 years or so, it has become extremely invasive in Southern Ontario. It is originally from Europe and Asia. It's native there. It doesn't cause a problem there, but here in North America, it has overtaken wetlands, ditches, anything, that, any moist soil that is around. And once it begins to grow, it overtakes the area, outcompetes the native species, and creates huge monocultures of Phragmites australis. You can see the size of it. The other name for it is European common reed. A reed is just a wetland grass. And really, it is a giant grass. You can see the large plumes of uh, flowers on the top there. And each of those plumes contains about a thousand seeds. Those seeds, when they're mature, become airborne and blow around the area and find themselves start growing again in other wet places. So it spreads along highway ditches very effectively because of the wind from the vehicles and then it can invade into natural areas. It is so dense that it is impossible really for many of the native animals to travel through it and it is not, does not provide food or shelter for those native animals. It becomes basically a dead zone as far as uh, biodiversity is concerned and, be, and for animals and other plants. So although there is uh, a native species of Phragmites, you will not see it in a dense patch like that and you won't see it in an urban area like Toronto. It, it does occur in some places in natural wetlands, and, uh, but I, I think that any, in any disturbed area, in an urban area, the Phragmites that you see is going to be the, the, nat the non-native species, the invasive species. However, sometimes in the early part of the season, there's another grass that does like wetlands. And uh, sometimes in the early part of the season, you may see uh, the Phragmites and this other grass growing together. And it's imp although it, my motto is, if you're in doubt, take it out, because we can always replace native species at a later time. And there's likely to be a seed bank in the soil of native species so that when the Phragmites is removed, what you see coming back is the other species that were there prior to the, the Phragmites invasion. So this grass here, one of the ways to tell the difference is to look at a structure on where the leaf connects with the stem. So there, in grasses, the terminology, there's a sheath that goes around the stem. There's a blade that looks is the grass. And there's a connection between the sheath and the blade that is found uh, just at that junction. So that, that little structure that connects the blade and the sheath is called the ligule. So the, the ligule is, is sticking up a little bit. It's raised. And on the back of the leaf, if you look at what we call the collar, there, it's a lighter color in the back here. It's like a, a sort of a beigey color, the collar. So that would be not Phragmites. And examination, that's a, a good way to tell the difference between Phragmites and some other grasses. So when you examine the same structures on Phragmites, you still have the sheath that fits around the stem and the blade that is coming up like this. And then you have that little structure inside that, that ligule as well. And it also has a collar. So on the Phragmites, the ligule is always a very fine brown line and it doesn't stick up from the blade. 
So, and the collar, it tends to be more green. So this plant is, is old, it's, uh, it's getting to the end of its uh, life, so, um, or the, not the end of its life, but the end of the season. When the first, uh, when the new growth comes out in the beginning of the season, there will often be fine hairs sticking up from that ligule. However, they do get worn off during the, the summer season. So you may even see some fine hairs. You will not see that on the, on the other grasses. You know, at this height, it's easy. When it's in flower, it's easy. But before it flowers, it's a little bit trickier to identify the plant. So um, always, I just, when I'm working on it, I just pull back, take a look at the legule. I know this one definitely has to come out. If it's a grass that is uh, a native grass, that it doesn't have that little fine line of the brown legule, then I'm going to leave it in, in the plant. But remember, if in doubt, take it out because native species can always be replaced. So in Ontario, uh, the use of herbicides is not permitted on or near water. Since Phragmites is a wetland species, in most cases it grows in air natural areas where there are aquatic environments. And so pesticides and herbicides are not permissible even if you have a pesticide license. So I have tried in my own way to develop a technique. It's a mechanical control. It does require a lot of uh, persistence and it is fairly labor intensive. I'm going to show you how to remove the Phragmites in an effective way that over time will control a patch of Phragmites that is growing in a wet area. So these are my tools of choice uh, for removing Phragmites. This one is a spade and uh, this one is called a transplanting shovel, but I don't, do it, I don't use it to transplant the Phragmites, I use it to remove it. One of the things uh, about the spades that maybe people don't think about is that I actually sharpen them with a grinder in order to keep them uh, sharp for cutting the stems. So I will demonstrate the technique with the spade. And uh, the reason I have the narrower transplanting shovel is that eventually when I get good control, there are other species of plants that grow in among the Phragmites, the, the, the sparse Phragmites stalks, and I don't want to damage those. So I can be selective about removing the, uh, the Phragmites stalks with this smaller shovel eventually. When I was trying to figure out the best way to control this plant, I decided I would think like a plant. And plants require photosynthesis in order to produce the energy that they need for growth, uh, growth of roots, stems, flowers, leaves, everything. So if I could prevent photosynthesis from happening in the plant, then I could weaken the structure of the plant. Now, 60% of the biomass of Phragmites is actually underground. It can go down rhizomes and roots. Rhizomes are underground stems and roots can go down 10 feet into the ground. So it is impossible to pull this plant out or dig it out without totally destroying the habitat. So if I can pers be persistent and keep removing the upper structure of the plant, and prevent photosynthesis from happening, I can weaken the underground structures and eventually get good control of the plant. It does take three to five years of persistence and multiple removals, but it can happen. When you look at a patch like this, uh, the, you know, it looks very daunting, but in three or four years of persistence, you can reduce the patch from having 100 to 150 stalks per square meter down to less than 20 stalks per square meter and, and when you continue to control it, eventually none. The best way in a big patch like this would be to have more than one person working on it and often in, uh, in public spaces, there are stewardship groups who do that kind of control. What I'm 
doing is I'm going to take the spade and I'm going to find where the stalk begins and the soil and I'm going to take and I'm going to put that spade at about a 45 degree angle from the on the soil and I'm going to be cutting the stalk below the surface. If I cut below the surface, then that way the plant has no ability to photosynthesize. So when I take it, I'm just going to kick it in. And I don't really need to lever it too much. This is a bit, so I'm going to get it out of here. Now this stalk, I always think it's a bonus when you get two for one kick. So I've got a live one and this one has been broken off. The interesting thing about this is that when you look below, you will notice by cutting it below the surface, the soil surface was here, that I have actually managed to also remove a new shoot. And this one, at this time of the year in October, these new shoots are being formed under the ground and they are the growth for next year. So you can see, and if you look here, I just expose it, you'll notice that there's a second shoot just coming out right there as well. So those would be the shoots that will be getting the head start next, next, fall, next spring. These growth nodes, once you remove below, then you can see that I've not only removed something from above the ground, but I've also inhibited the growth of some of the, some of the new growth that would be uh, preparing for next, next spring. So that was a, just with one, one cut. So all I'm doing, all I'm interested in doing is cutting below the surface. That means no photosynthesis above and also I am removing some of the new growth from that will be growing up next year. So I'm going to place my cut stalks on the ground. I'm going to keep working and I'm going to see. So I want to just keep cutting below. Ah. Now, if I don't get it the first time, I'll try again from a different angle. There we go. Now, these are, these are last year's dead stalks, but you can see that they still have a root structure down here, a little worm here, get them out. And these still have the potential for growth. They're still alive down below and there is actually a very small growth node right there. If this is mown, because it is a grass, sometimes that's one of the ways that, that uh, people attempt to control the plant. If this would be mown with a lawnmower, or a, uh, that new growth node would be stimulated to grow. So although the stalks above ground appear to be dead, they are actually functioning stalks and they are still alive at the base. And the very tall ones, and uh, ones that are, are dead but still standing, they actually provide a function in moist soil. There is a low uh, amount of oxygen in moist soil. If you've ever overwatered a potted plant, you know that the roots drown and the plant dies. So when this grows in moist soil, these, these uh, standing stalks from last year that appear to be dead above, are actually a functioning part of the plant and they do help with gas exchange down below in the lower structures underneath the soil where the soil is very wet. So they do uh, help with oxygen uh, intake and carbon dioxide ex uh, removal uh, or carbon dioxide intake and oxygen uh, removal underground so that the rhizomes, the underground structures can still st stay healthy under the ground. So by removing both the live ones and the dead ones, then you also inhibit the ability of the plant uh, rhizomes to stay healthy under the ground in the, in the really wet, saturated soil. I'm just gonna 
I have to move around. <laughs> Depends sometimes which way the rhizome goes. Got it. Oh, darn, that one broke. Okay. So here is a classic contrast between the livestock from this year and last year's stock. It was alive last year. This is the old seed head from last year. This is the new seed head from this year. And these two actually originate from the same location. So you can see, if you take a look, you can see they came from the same rhizome the same underground stem and they already have a new this this is the this this one is the dead one but it already has attached at the bottom next year's new shoot so it is i always say they're they're not dead they're just sleeping so they will they will be they they take part in the healthy growth of this plant if you do remove the Phragmites at a time when they're not in bloom, that's not a concern. You don't have to worry about it. You just have vegetative material to, to dispose of. However, if the plant is already in flower, then it's important not to allow those flowers to spread anywhere. So uh, what I do is I cut off the flower heads. So all of these plants down here, I'm going to be cutting off the flower heads and these there we go. And these I'm going to dispose of in a garbage bag. So I'm going to place these in a sealed bag. I'm going to tie it off. I'm going to keep this bag until the, the uh, flower heads have begun to rot and then I'm going to place it into landfill so that I don't allow those seeds to escape and spread somewhere else. Depending on the temperature, uh, usually I leave them outside in the sunshine for a couple of weeks. And if you feel the bag, you can feel them start to get a little bit mushy. So two to three weeks in the bag, and then they can be placed in landfill. So if you notice, uh, the seeds, they're they're just beginning to mature and they're a little bit fuzzy and so they're a little bit like dandelion seeds that blow in the wind. If you think about uh, the size of this, these two seed heads, there are approximately a thousand seeds in each of those seed heads. Approximately 10% of those thousand seeds are actually viable and will grow somewhere when they land if they land on a wet place. However, if you think about each of these is a thousand, that's already 200 plants that can germinate from these two flower heads. And when you think about how many flower heads are in this patch, there are thousands and thousands of seeds that are viable that are going to drift to other areas in the wind and find uh, and begin to grow. And once, once the first plant grows, it then spreads underground by those underground stems and rhizomes and the, and the culture, the, the patch will expand exponentially over the years if it's not under control. The vegetative material that's left over without the seed heads, then I, that can be disposed of in, uh, in to a, a municipal composting facility. I would, you cannot compost this in your, in your backyard composter, the, the plant material would remain alive. But in a municipal compost facility, they usually can reach high enough temperatures that it will kill all of the parts of the plant. So uh, the best way to do that is they obviously don't fit in the bag. So the best way to do that is to make them a little bit more compact because if you just uh, I, I try to be a bit um, frugal with my my paper bags so I want to get as much as I can into the bag as possible so I what I do is I break up the stems into a small bundle 
And this is actually easier in uh, July and August when the plant material is not as dried out. And, uh, and then I put it in the bag. So, so I'm going to, I take it in use, I, I take it in small bundles so that I can break it. and place it in the bag. I try to make the bundle small enough that it doesn't protrude from the bag. And then I allow this to dry uh, before, if it's, this, this, uh, this is pretty dry, so I could put it out for the composting facility. Uh, if it's really green, I usually let it dry for a couple of weeks in the sun before I actually put it out to the curb. Um, if you live in a municipality where you can burn this material, when it is dry, it also could be burned to uh, dispose of it. That's actually an easier way because it doesn't require as you can just dry it on a tarp or uh, a pile and then burn it. When I'm up north, uh, out of the city, I have the capability of burning it and that's how I dispose of it. So whenever you're working with removal of Phragmites, it's a good idea to wear, um, it's not personal protective e equipment per se, it's, but it does protect you. So you need some sturdy shoes. I'm wearing work boots, safety boots, but that doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be safety boots, but it should be sturdy shoes because you are kicking the shovel repeatedly. Um, you also want to wear, I like to wear long pants and long sleeves and gloves. The reason that I do that is because the leaves on the Phragmites, they have a serrated edge and that edge can give you little fine cuts on your skin and that does result in a bit of a rash on your skin. So, uh, and, and the, the paper cuts are the cuts can actually slice your hands. So when you're working with them, when you're removing it, handling them, breaking them up into the uh, into uh, disposal bags, that kind of thing, definitely you want to use uh, to, to have your hands and your arms and your legs protected from the damage that the leaves can do. So you'll notice that on this side and this side of the path, we have Phragmites growing, and yet under our feet, we do not. So although mowing uh, can make the plant appear to disappear, uh, it, it can prevent it from flowering. But in fact, if we stopped mowing, this path would become solid Phragmites because these plants here and, on, and the ones on this side are actually connected under the ground by those underground structures I was talking about, those rhizomes. They actually, that's how this plant uh, started growing on this side. About three or four years ago, it wasn't here, but it is now encroaching on this part of the meadow as well. So the rhizomes have gone under the path and are growing, are coming up on the other side of the path. So although mowing can uh, suppress the growth, it does not kill the plant. So. And it, and it is able to just uh, travel under the ground and show up where it's not being mown. So once the removal has been completed uh, at, for, at the end of the season, it, there's no, there is the option of doing some restoration planting. It is possible to plant in some, uh, some native species if you would like to encourage those to develop in that area. However, in my experience, the, uh, the soil does contain a seed bank of native species that have been there since the beginning and will regrow as soon as they have the opportunity. I always think it's better to just wait and see in the first couple of years 
because the rhizome mass under the ground is still quite dense, so it makes it very difficult to, to do much digging to replant, and disturbing the soil actually induces the growth of the Phragmites. It thrives in disturbed soil. If you loosen up the soil, it makes it much easier for those rhizomes to go through the soil. So in my opinion, it's better to just leave the soil the way it is and allow any seedlings, uh, or uh, once you've cleaned up the area, to allow any, any seedlings of native species that are, are, that are able to grow in the soil naturally to start to prevail. And in my experience, it, it's been interesting that it uh, depends on the area that you're removing the Phragmites from, but the repertoire or the biodiversity of plants that come back is representative of what was there in the past.